Hello everybody. Welcome to the Mind of Watercolor. My name is Steve Mitchell and I'm very excited to bring you this workshop. If you're not familiar with my YouTube channel, we just celebrate all things watercolor. We try to get into the mind of watercolor and see how it thinks, learn what conditions it likes, and set those conditions for success. Now this first part of the workshop is going to be a landscape. So let's get right into it and I'll show you what you need to get set up and we'll get started. Well these are the brushes that I plan to use. This is a a three quarter inch oval wash. This is a number 10 round. And this is a number two rigger or liner. In addition to brushes, uh, I like to have some tape uh, just to border off my painting. I like to have a nice clean edge. Um, I kind of prefer the white acid free artist's tape, but you can also use, paint, use painter's tape. You just want a low clean tape where the water won't seep underneath. In addition, you want some kind of a soft eraser, uh, a kneaded or a white eraser, one that won't damage the paper, and a pencil. I prefer mechanical, but a sharpened number two pencil works fine. I also will probably be using this sprayer. This is helpful to wet areas, but it also gives you some nice little uh, leaf effects, and I'll show you how that works later. Well, the paper I'm using today is Strathmore 500 series, and it's the 300 pound Gemini, natural white. Just a really beautiful paper, very heavyweight, won't buckle, stands up to a lot of abuse and a lot of working. Well, here are the colors I'll be using today. Ultramarine blue, Prussian blue, Azo green, Indian yellow, Quinacridone red, and red iron oxide. I'll also be using sepia and Payne's gray. Well, here's a quick look at my work setup. When I'm starting off with the painting, I usually go on a low incline like this. This is kind of a preference, but with landscape, uh, when you start out with your sky washes and your big background washes, I find that I like to be able to pick this up and turn it around. And I also don't like the washes to run down to the bottom too quickly. As I get more to details and smaller areas, I'll, I'll a lot of times will proceed to an easel like this. But really, it's just work however you're most comfortable. You may find in the beginning with the big wet washes that this much of an incline allows the water to travel down too fast. I like a big open palette. Now you can use a weld palette if you, if you prefer. This is just my preference. But I do recommend you have a big mixing area. And if you tend to like to use the little compact weld palettes, then just get yourself a big mixing area like a styrofoam plate. It's nice to have that handy. When you're doing skies and ground washes, you'll find that useful. Of course, water. Um, this is my sprayer. I also just try to have plenty of blotting. This is a, a blotter I always keep down near the end of my palette so I can adjust the moisture in my brush coming out of the, the water bucket. And I'll keep a rag in my other hand, my left hand, to squeeze out water quickly. So it's sometimes I'll even have paper towels down under here, the blotter. You almost can't have too much in terms of towels and wiping apparatus because you're constantly adjusting the moisture in your brush. Well, this is some of the reference that I'll be using. This is available for you on the workshop page on my workshop page if you want to download it but you can use your own if you like uh, you don't have to use any and I don't necessarily recommend copying photo reference exactly the way I usually approach it is I pick things that have certain elements that I want to incorporate in my painting and that's what I'm doing here I like this grouping of trees and I might use some facsimile of that I also like the layering of these kind of weedy areas here and this tree line back here, on this, I like these distant hills. And it just helps to have the facts. Have the facts in front of you so you can do an accurate rendering if that's what you're after. 
I also get good clues about coloring. Uh, I like the wispiness of these clouds, and I might try to incorporate that. So that's just a quick word about photo reference and how I use it. My painting will come out unique, I believe, but it just helps to have factual information about the items that you're going to paint. And if you want to go out and take your own photography, uh, that much the better. I always think it's a good idea to do thumbnails prior to doing a landscape, especially if you're not copying a photo reference exactly, but you're coming up with your own composition. All this does is it just gives you a chance to experiment with composition and value. And those are two things that you don't want to spend a lot of time adjusting on the fly. You want to kind of know where you're going with the composition in advance. And you want to kind of know where you're going with the values, the darks and the lights. So I, I like to work those out in a thumbnail if I'm not rendering a scene exactly from my photo reference. Now what I'm using here is water-soluble graphite and a water brush. This is totally optional. You can use anything you want. You can use crayon, pastel, pencil, charcoal, you name it. Well, here's the three thumbnails I ended up with. I'm kind of leaning towards this center one here. I think it, it gives a nice a lot of nice possibilities. I have a, a far distant sky, some distant hills, a middle background, then a mid-ground, and I even have some foreground here where I can do some nice little grassy area and maybe some stones. So the next step will just be doing a light sketch onto my actual painting paper. Well, I begin by taping off my watercolor paper or actually taping it down to my drawing board. I like being able to have this taped down to a rigid surface and I can pick the board up and and tilt it around and move washes around. This is one inch white acid-free artist's tape. You can also use standard painter's tape that you get from a home supply or hardware supply. Now the next thing I do is just uh, consult my chosen thumbnail in which case I really like this one and I'm going to use it as my main guide. And I just start lightly penciling in on my watercolor paper where the main elements go. You may not even be able to see this well on video, but I'm just very lightly penciling in some of the borders of the main features. It's just a guide, just a roadmap. I like giving myself the opportunity for neat Unexpected things to happen with watercolor. That's the whole part of the mind of watercolor. But by the same token, it's very important that you plan. That you take some of the decision making out of the painting process. Because when, when you're watercoloring, things start to happen pretty fast. If you've taken some of the decisions, like value, placement of, of the elements on the page. If you've taken those decisions out of the painting process. You've actually helped yourself. Now, happy accidents are a cool part of the process, but there's a happy medium there between planning and just letting the paint do whatever it wants. In this case, I'm going to do both. I'm going to allow watercolor to give me some of its own painting. It's going to allow it to do some of the painting for me, but I'm also going to plan how to corral it and how to you know, limit where it goes and how it goes. With watercolor, it can paint entire passages of the painting for you if you let it. Hopefully we'll see some of that develop as we go along. All right, well, let's get into it. And we're gonna start with the sky. Now I know you can't see the pencil lines from my thumbnail, but trust me, they're there. And it's not really important that you see them, uh, just to know that I lightly penciled them in as I showed you earlier. And I don't have a lot of sky. There's only about this much sky. <clears throat> and I don't want this to be too busy. So I'm going to treat the sky fairly simply. I might try to get a couple of these wisps in there from this photo reference. But I'm not going to do a lot. Because we don't see a lot of sky. The first step in, in usually any sky. And you can paint skies dry. Some artists do. But I like to wet the sky. And my, my foliage line, or my foreground and middle ground elements, 
kind of goes right here, but I'm going to take the, the water just down a little past that <clears throat> so as not to create a hard edge. I want in the distance there to, to be a soft blending between the sky and any uh, distant elements. I get a little blurring that way. I can always go back and add a little more definition later. Now when you're wetting, pre-wetting any area, if I get my head in the way, I pardon, pardon me on that, but sometimes I have to look over the top. If you're pre-wetting an area, especially if you're using an all-cotton paper like this, uh, and this is 300 pound paper, so it's very thirsty. But once you get it wet, uh, it does just really great things with washes. Um, you kind of have to lay down some water first, give it maybe 10, 15 seconds. Then usually I go back over it with another coat of water. What you're looking for is a nice even sheen over the whole area. And as areas start to turn dull from the sheen, you can tell that they're soaking up the water. Now I'm using a uh, ultramarine blue here, and I'm probably going to cut it back a little bit with some Payne's Gray. Add just maybe a touch of Prussian blue. You can see what's happening there, hopefully. This watercolor always dries much lighter than when you put it down. So I'm just going to go back in and dab in towards the top here. I'm getting a nice gentle shift down towards the bottom. And I really don't think I want to do much more than that. What I'm doing now is is washing out my brush, getting all the pigment out of my brush. I'm gonna I'm gonna blot it out real good. And I think I'm gonna pick up some in here. Um once with a dry brush, once I start picking it up, it will limit the movement. So I'm just lifting because a dry brush it acts like a sponge and soaks it back up. And when you do this, you may have to keep blotting your brush, keep it dry so it continues to pick up. Because as it picks up moisture, then it, the brush becomes damp again. It doesn't lift as well. So I'm continually going back here and squeezing out. And I like that. I don't think I'm going to do much more than just that. So the sky on this painting is a minor part. So now I'm coming down here to the Prussian blue and uh, mixing just a little of that ultramarine. So we've got the sky color. And I'm just letting this blend. This is my middle ground element here. And I'll probably do some layers over this, but I'm just doing this so it will blend in with the sky. And hopefully it's, it's wetter down here and I'm on a little bit of a tilt. So my color shouldn't be going back that way i don't think and so far it's not And we're going to go ahead and block in that distant, most distant hill. And that's creeping up a little bit there, so I blot my brush out and I'm going to lift just to stop the flow. A lot of times where there are hard edges, 
You want to break that up. You don't want it to get too edgy. You can use your finger. Yeah, I'm getting a little bit of a rough dry brush effect there. All right, so I've let this top part completely dry now. Got a nice soft sky and a nice soft background. So I'm going to start laying in some more of the details and coming forward. I've got a sort of a rolling hill back here. Just to show my thumbnail. It's behind this tree here. And this needs to be able to stand out. So that's going to be fairly light as if it's like a, a sunlit meadow on a hill. So let's go ahead and lay that in. And we're going to come over here to a little Indian yellow mixed in with the Prussian blue. And I'm just going to paint this in dry, but I'll probably do some blending. That makes a nice green here on the hilltop. But now where it comes down, I'm going to pull in some more of that yellow. I want this hill to be fairly light colored. Ooh, got a little blue in the brush there. It's all right. Gonna get covered. And I still want kind of a blue greenish tint because this is further in the distance and this is where aerial perspective comes in aerial perspective is just demonstrating or indicating distance through color and intensity the further away something is the bluer it is because of the atmosphere and the less intense the colors just want to keep this, this very light so that what I put in front of it will really stand out. And there will be a lot of details in front of that. So and I think maybe I'm just gonna, gonna dot in some maybe some there's some bush things coming in from the top. As long as it's light down here, I think that'll be good. Maybe a little tree line coming in there. And uh, I'm just trying to blur out this line here. And that'll eliminate an edge. And now I've got a nice background there to layer over the details that'll come in front of it. So we're going to let that dry. But we'll stop right there for today. I hope you'll join me in the next workshop where we'll start working our way forward through the middle ground and the foreground and we'll complete this landscape. Look forward to seeing you then.